Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live Virtual Planetarium. In just a few moments, we will be meeting our educators who will be taking us on a tour exploring space. But before we do, we do want to go over some of the features of our webinar today. So first off, my name is Christina. I'll be serving as your moderator today. And although you can see me right now, you'll mostly be hearing my voice later as I share your observations and questions with our educators. If you would like to ask a question or make an observation today and you are watching on Zoom, you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And don't forget to include your name and age if you would like a shout out. If you need captions today, you can get those by selecting show captions on the closed caption button on Zoom. And if you happen to be watching on Facebook or on YouTube today, unfortunately, we will not be able to see your comments or your questions, but we're so happy you're joining us and we do hope you enjoy the program. But with all of that being said, I would like to invite our educators to turn on their cameras, introduce themselves and get started. Hello everyone, my name is Katie, my pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be your guide as we explore space, but I can't do it alone. Hello everybody, my name is Talia, I also use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your pilot today, flying you through space. Wonderful, thank you Talia. Um, so today I thought that it would be appropriate and exciting to dedicate this episode to Pluto, um, and that is because 15 years ago today on January 19th um, was the launch of the New Horizons spacecraft, which is the only mission that um, we have ever sent out to explore Pluto. And it was the first mission to actually get an up close look at Pluto. Um, before this particular mission, New Horizons, um, we had some pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope that it kind of just made Pluto look like a giant disco ball because it was so pixelated. Um, so this was very exciting and it flew by Pluto uh, six years ago. That was a long time ago. Um, so we're going to go into that a little bit later, but I just want to start off with a general overview of our solar system so we can talk about what types of things you'd find in a solar system and, of course, the question, what happened to Pluto, right? We all know that it used to be a planet or maybe um, if you're younger, uh, it, it might be news to you, um, but it used to be a planet and astronomers reclassified it back in 2006, actually just shortly after the launch of New Horizons. Um, so Talia has us right now overlooking our solar system. So why don't you go ahead and just type into the Q&A any types of objects that you might find in our solar system. And that'll kind of be like a warm up question. So anything that you'd find in our solar system. Awesome. And so we'll give everybody a moment to type. I know that we're not all speedy typers, but we have some responses starting to come in. Um, the first two being planets and then also stars. Some folks are mentioning comets. Um, then we have a nice long list here, including moons, asteroids, asteroid belts, uh, the Kuiper belt, the Oort cloud. So there's a lot of really good things to work with here. Wow. Yeah, those are awesome um, answers. And yeah, I think they're all correct. Um, lots of planets, right? We have eight planets in our solar system. Uh, each of those planets, well, besides two of them, um, have moons around them. Mercury and Venus do not have any moons, but the rest of the planets do, uh, or at least have one moon. Um, we've got asteroids in the solar system, Kuiper Belt objects, Oort cloud, that's where the comets come from. And in our solar system in particular, we just have one star, which is the sun. So all of the other stars that you see when you look up at the nighttime sky, those are outside of our solar system and they're much, much farther away than anything is in our own solar system. Um, so right at the middle there, and it's kind of hard to see because all of the planets that are in the inner solar system are pretty close to the sun, um, but Talia zoomed us in a little bit. You can see the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And so those are the four inner rocky planets. They're the smaller planets too in the solar system. And then as we move out, 
we can see the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And all of those planets are made of gas, and they're called the gas giants because they are incredibly massive. Um, Jupiter, for example, you could fit over 1,300 Earths inside of Jupiter, which is the largest planet in the solar system. And then you might notice that there is one other orbit line out there, kind of sticks out from some of the other ones. That is the orbit line of Pluto. So Pluto is no longer considered a planet in our solar system. Um, but let's just go ahead and make some basic observations about its orbit before we start talking about why we don't call it a planet anymore. So um, take a look at that outermost orbit and make some observations. What is its shape? Does it do anything weird? Um, anything else you, you're observing, go ahead and type it into the Q&A. All right, so we're starting to get some thoughts here, Katie. It looks like the first person said that they noticed everything looked like an oval shape. Another person said that it seems like these are at an angle. Um, another person said they're not in the same plane as the other planets. They're not parallel. Maybe they have slightly different roots. Yeah, excellent observations once again. Um, so you'll, you might have noticed that Pluto's orbit is very oval shaped. It's got more, it kind of looks like an egg. Um, and this shape is called elliptical. While the orbits of the other planets um, or the eight planets in our solar system are fairly circular. They're not perfect circles. They are technically slightly oval, um, but Pluto's is definitely much more elliptical than the rest of them. Um, I think someone mentioned that it doesn't really line up with the plane or it looks like it's crooked. And that's also true. So Pluto's orbit is tilted away from the plane of the rest of the solar system. So all of the Planets tend to orbit kind of in this flat plane around the sun that's called the ecliptic and Pluto does uh, veer away from that a little bit. And you also might have noticed that it crosses orbit lines with Neptune for a little while. So at some points in its orbit, it's actually closer to the sun than Neptune is, which is kind of a interesting thing to think about. And so I also want to just talk about how far away Pluto is. So the farther you go from the sun, the longer it takes for you to orbit. So like the Earth takes one year, 365 days to make one full orbit around the sun. But Pluto, because it's almost 4 billion miles away from the sun, um, it actually takes 248 years just to orbit the sun one time. So it is very, very far away. And that will come into play a little bit later when we start talking about New Horizons. Um, okay, so great observations about Pluto's orbit. Let's talk about Pluto itself. So we classified the planets in the solar system, right? We have the inner rocky planets and the outer gas giants. So it might be, might lead you to think that Pluto is a gas giant. But that is not the case. Pluto is very small and it's made mostly of ice. Um, so it's kind of like a dirty snowball out really far away from the sun. And if you were to compare Pluto to the Earth, um, or rather the United States, it would only take up about half of the United States. The entire object of Pluto would only take up about half of the United States. So it is very tiny um, and doesn't quite fit in with those gas giants, but that is not the reason that it was reclassified. Um, so to be a planet, you have to orbit the sun, which Pluto does. Uh, you also need to be massive enough to be round because the more mass you have, the more gravity you have. And so gravity can pull you into a round shape. And there is a certain size that an object needs to be in order for it to be round. Pluto happens to meet this limit. Um, so it is round. So those two things, it has checked off the planet list, but it's the last one where it kind of flunks the planet test. And that last one is that it needs to clear its orbit. 
So we're going to explore that a little bit further. But first, I want to pause and see if there have if there have been any questions that have come in so far. Now that you posed it, it wouldn't surprise me if a question comes in, Katie. But at the moment, it was mostly observations from your previous um, questions to us that have come in. OK, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, if, you, if anybody has any questions throughout the program, feel free to throw them in the Q&A and we can take them as we go or we can take them at the end. Um, all right, so back to Pluto and uh, whether this has happened before, right? Because this was all a very shocking, I think a lot of us uh, were a little bit shocked when they decided to um, stop calling Pluto a planet back in 2006, because we, you know, everybody's grown up with Pluto. Um, it was always the ninth planet, but it's actually not the first time that this has happened in our solar system. It's just that the last time that this has happened was a very long time ago. It was in the early 1800s. Um, so I don't think anybody really remembers it at this point. But back then, before the discovery of Neptune even, um, our solar system had at 1.16 planets. So astronomers were observing the region of space in between Mars and Jupiter, and they discovered a few objects that they named planets, and Ceres is one of them. So um, Talia is highlighting that for us right now. Um, Ceres is in that, that area as well as uh, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. These were some other objects in between Mars and Jupiter that were called planets at the time. And so we had all these planets in between there out to Uranus because Neptune hadn't been discovered just yet. And then by the 1850s or so, astronomers started discovering a lot in between Mars and Jupiter. It wasn't just these few objects. Um, they were discovering hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of objects in between Mars and Jupiter, all made of similar material, all very small. And so I have a question for all of you. What orbits in between Mars and Jupiter that we know of today? And I will give you a hint when we were talking about objects in the solar system earlier, um, someone mentioned this group of objects. All righty, it looks like we have a couple of guesses here for the asteroid belt, Katie. Yeah, that's correct. Um, in that area, we know of the asteroid belt now. And so when astronomers were discovering planets in this region, um, they hadn't discovered the entire asteroid belt yet. So they were just finding the biggest objects in this part of space. And so they were calling them planets until they started finding a whole bunch of objects that look and act just like these initial planets. Um, until they kind of just made an entire new category of objects um, called asteroids. So as we learned more about the solar system, they changed Ceres and Pallas and Juna and Vesta from planets to asteroids. So that's a very similar thing that happened to Pluto. Uh, so Pluto was discovered back in 1930 by someone named Clyde Tombow. Um, and pretty much by accident, too. He wasn't necessarily looking for um, Pluto or a small object like Pluto, but he thought there might be another planet out there. Um, and he found Pluto, and it stayed that way for a long time. It was the only object beyond Neptune that was discovered in our solar system or that was known about in our solar system. So we just called it a planet and it stayed that way for a really long time until the late 1990s and early 2000s when astronomers started discovering that Pluto has a whole bunch of neighbors out orbiting with Pluto. And so Talia is highlighting a few of these neighbors, some of the bigger ones, um, but there are hundreds of thousands of objects out orbiting with Pluto, and these are members of the Kuiper Belt. 
And so it's very similar to the asteroid belt. It's just farther away, um, orbiting out with Pluto. And they all are made up of similar material. So lots of ice and dust out in this part of the solar system. And they're all small and they have wonky orbits that are very tilted and elliptical. So if we go back to the point that Pluto doesn't clear its orbit, the Kuiper belt is why. It's basically taking up this part of space with a whole bunch of other objects. So it's not gra gravitationally dominating this part in the solar system. And so that is where Pluto failed the planet test. And so now instead of calling it a planet, we call it a dwarf planet or a Kuiper belt object. Now the term dwarf planet is a little bit confusing because it still has the word planet in there. Um, but basically a dwarf planet is any object that doesn't fit the criteria to be a planet, but it's still big enough to be round. So there are five of them currently, Ceres in the asteroid belt. So the one that used to be a planet um, in the asteroid belt is now a dwarf planet. And then out with Pluto in the Kuiper belt, we have Eris, Haumea, Makimaki, um, and I'm missing one. Am I missing one? No, you said Pluto. I, oh, and Pluto, yeah, of course. <laughs> So there are probably a lot of other dwarf planets out there that astronomers just haven't discovered yet. Um, so that list might get quite a bit longer. So that brings us to the question, well, do we still care about Pluto if it's not a planet anymore? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Just because it's not a planet doesn't mean that it's less interesting or that it doesn't deserve a mission of its own. Um, and that's why astronomers sent New Horizons out to Pluto. And so we're going to get a, a little bit of an up-close look at the New Horizons spacecraft. So as I mentioned before, it was launched today, but 15 years ago. And it took nine years for New Horizons to get to Pluto, just because of how far Pluto is away. And it was going fast, um, and it is going fast. It's still traveling through space even now. And it, uh, I believe, started out around 35,000 miles an hour. And then it actually stole a little bit of momentum from Jupiter on its way out to the outer solar system so that it could gain speed. And so this was too fast to stick around Pluto. It wasn't able to... Um, get into an orbit around Pluto or anything like that. It was just a flyby, um, but we still got a lot of really awesome data back from the spacecraft. So we've learned quite a bit about Pluto. So the next thing that I would like to do is have us go on kind of a ride along. So Talia has to switch programs briefly. And as she's getting that ready for us, um, Christina, have there been any questions that have come in? There are a few questions now. Um, one was just kind of specific or clarifying what we were seeing on screen. Sophie was asking, um, what were the larger rings we were looking at beyond Pluto? Oh, beyond Pluto. Yeah, so some of those other rings out there, um, they might have been the orbits of the other dwarf planets. So Eris, Haumea, Makimaki, some of those other ones that are even farther out than Pluto. And I know that this program in particular, which is called NASA's Eyes, also indicates um, the paths of some spacecraft that have gone out farther than Pluto. So you might have picked up on um, the the paths of the Voyager spacecraft that have gone out very far. And we have another question here, kind of the difference between, I think looking at size versus mass. Um, they were saying, um, some people say that Eris is bigger than Pluto, even though it might be slightly larger, Pluto actually is more massive. Can you explain this please? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a really great question. Um, so the difference between mass and size. So size is a measurement of how much stuff or how, how much space something takes up. So, you know, Jupiter is very large in size. It takes up a lot of space. Mass is a measurement of how much stuff something is made up of. Um, so you can have something that's very big in size, but not super massive 
which would just make it not very dense. It would be very airy. Um, so something like Jupiter, a planet like Jupiter, is both very large in size, and it's also made up of a lot of stuff. So it's also very massive. So that's the difference between those two terms. And um, it's easy to accidentally switch between the two, but they do mean different things. Uh, and that's a good thing to point out. And I believe, um, yeah, either Pluto or Eris, one of the two is more massive and one of the two is larger. And I'm not sure which is which. Talia, do you remember off the top of your head? So at the moment, we think Pluto is just a little bit larger than Eris. When Eris was first discovered, uh, we thought that it was larger than Pluto. Um, but I believe the last measurement I heard is they still think Eris is just a skosh smaller than Pluto, like not very much at all. But um, so I guess that would make that the more massive one. Yeah, so pretty close, it sounds like. Um, all right, well, it looks like we are ready for our ride along. So just to kind of um, give you some context here, the spacecraft that you're looking at is New Horizons. And this these are the moments leading up to the closest approach. Um, that happened in July of 2015. Down on the bottom left, you can see the distance to Pluto, so how many miles away we are from Pluto. And it also tells you how fast um, the spacecraft is going right now. So we're going to speed up time a little bit, and you'll get to see what it was like when New Horizons flew by Pluto. You can see it's getting really close. It got, it looked like under seven or under 8,000 miles away from the surface of Pluto, which is incredibly close. And you'll also notice there are lots of rings around Pluto. So all of those are Pluto's moons, because even though it's very small, it still has five moons. Um, Charon is its largest moon, followed by um, Nix, Styx, Hydra, and Kerberos, which I believe is the smallest one. And a couple of those moons were actually discovered after they launched New Horizons. Um, so again, we're always learning new stuff. But let's look at Pluto itself with all of the data that came back from New Horizons. Because like I said, before this spacecraft, we only saw it through Hubble, and Hubble didn't take a very good picture of it. So this is a much better picture um, taken by New Horizons. So you'll notice that the surface is pretty dynamic. There are lots of different um, regions on it that are just very different in terms of like topography <laughs> and uh, mountain ranges. There are some areas that are really smooth, some areas where you can find craters. But astronomers were really expecting Pluto to be kind of this old, boring place where there's not really much going on on its surface because it's very far away from the sun and it's very cold. It's almost negative 300 degrees out here by Pluto and on the surface of Pluto. So they weren't expecting a whole lot, but it turns out that Pluto has uh, all kinds of stuff happening on its surface. It has mountain ranges and valleys and glaciers made of nitrogen ice and methane ice. We even think that it has cryovolcanoes on its surface, which are volcanoes that end up spewing out ice instead of lava or molten rock. Um, astronomers also think that there might be a subsurface ocean on Pluto, which would be really wild because that would mean it would have to be warm enough inside of Pluto um, to allow for liquid water to exist. And so the mechanisms behind that are still being studied. Um, there are a couple of spots on Pluto that I wanted to talk about. One of them is called Tombaugh Regio, which is named after Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto back in 1930. And that's kind of the classic heart-shaped spot on Pluto. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a good look at it. And this particular spot is very reflective, so that's why it looks brighter than a lot of the other regions on Pluto. And half of it is made of 
um, nitrogen ice and methane ice. Actually, bo both halves are, are made of it, but that ice will sometimes vaporize and become nitrogen gas and methane gas if Pluto ever um, heats up, which it does sometimes as in its orbit around the sun. And so then those gases kind of get transferred over to the other side of the uh, of Tombaugh Regio and then end up becoming glaciers. And then there's like a whole glacial flowing system between these two lobes of Tombaugh Regio, um, these nitrogen and methane cycles that are really fascinating. There's also a darker region next to Tombaugh Regio called Cthulhu Regio. So if you're a fan of the Lovecraft mythos, um, this area is named after um, the deity from, from that mythology. And so that's kind of why I like it, just because of the name. Um, but there are certain regions of this Cthulhu Regio um, or Cthulhu, um, what's the new name for it? Macula, Cthulhu Macula, which just means spot, um, where they think that cryovolcanoes are happening. Um, so lots of really cool stuff going on on Pluto. It proved to be a much more interesting place than astronomers expected. Um, so I will pause there and just take questions for the rest of the program. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, we have a bunch coming in, some from like earlier topics and some for more current topics. Um, but one I didn't want to forget was from Henry H. Seven, who was just thinking about how orbiting works. And if you could explain how do planets orbit the sun? Yeah, that is a really, really good question. So the sun is the most massive object in the solar system. You could, in terms of size, you could fit over a million Earths inside of it. So that gives you a good idea about its size, but it's also just made up of a lot of material. If you combined all of the planets together, all of the material from all the planets, that would still be less than 1% um, of the mass of the sun. So it has a lot of gravity because it's so massive. And when one object has more gravity than another object, um, you can get an orbital situation. So like the moon orbits around the earth because the earth is more massive and has a stronger gravitational force. And so the moon, because it's, it's already moving, um, it's just, it gets stuck in orbit. And so it's kind of continuously falling toward the earth, but it never hits the earth just gets stuck like that. And so all of the planets are also orbiting the sun. They're falling toward the sun, but they're moving fast enough that they never will hit the sun. Um, so that's kind of what being in orbit is. It's just free falling around an object that has um, a stronger gravitational force. I feel like if I was a planet, I'd be very dizzy all the time. Me too. <laughs> Um, and I think a follow-up to orbits, Katie, is um, do we tend to see a trend in the direction of orbits or the direction of the spin of planets in the orbits? Yes, we do. Um, and that's because most of the objects in the solar system formed from the same cloud of gas and dust. So uh, when a star forms, it forms from a cloud of gas and dust that's spinning around and it's kind of like a flat disk. Um, it's called a protoplanetary disk. And so you have the new star at the center and you've got all of this extra material still spinning around it. And that's the material that clumps to form planets and moons and anything else you'd find in the solar system. So things tend to orbit in the same direction because of that initial um, cloud that everything formed from. Cool, and last question, because I know we're out of time. Hopefully it's a quick one, which is, do you know if we're still getting any data from New Horizons as it travels? Yeah, so New Horizons didn't stop at Pluto. It kept going to investigate another Kuiper Belt object that's even farther out in the solar system um, called Arakoff. And this object, it, you might have seen pictures of it um, when, the, when it flew by a couple of years ago, but it kind of looked like a snowman. Yes, Talia's got it for us. Um, and so it's studying this object and now it's just kind of keep it's 
he's still floating out in uh, the Kuiper Belt, but it went to study this object because this object uh, is supposedly one of the oldest, or it will give us some insight into the really, really early days of our solar system and what conditions were like then. Awesome, that's very exciting. Thank you so much, Katie. And maybe if we could have Talia come back, I'd like to give Katie and Talia a huge thank you for giving us this awesome tour today. I hope you all have a good day. You can say goodbye to our audience. Thanks everyone. Bye. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us today for being just such active participants. You all had so many great questions and observations and I do apologize if we ran out of time and didn't get a chance to ask your question, but I did see them, they were fast and they were really wonderful. So thank you for sharing them. Um, if you'd like to have a chance to ask more questions in this program or programs like this in the future, you can check out all of our offerings at mos.org slash mos at home. If you'd like to learn how you can support the museum, you can do so by visiting our website at engage.mos.org slash welcome. And if you'd like to try to do this tour on your own using a computer, I have the link to the site that we use today called NASA's Eyes. And uh, just take note of the website there and you can maybe check it out later today or later this week. But thank you all so much for joining the program. We hope you have a good day and we'll catch you at the next one.